the University of Chicago's video series on generative AI. I'm Kevin Boyd, the CIO of the university. I'm very pleased to have with me today Professor Sanjog Mishra, the Professor of Marketing and Applied AI at the Booth School of Business. Professor, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about how um, AI is changing the world of business. And so let's, uh, let's start with a little uh, high level. Uh, tell me how um, you see industries and business being changed by generative AI. So maybe we start, just take a step back and think about AI and then how um, move into generative AI. I think AI has already had a big impact in business, right? whether it's uh, internalizing data and changing processes or making kind of improved decisions. Uh, we've had, we've, over the last decade or two, there's been major impact of AI. Generative AI, this idea of like converting prompts into outputs that are useful in various contexts uh, is a recent phenomenon and there's obvious application areas. So uh, it has that impact on any time there's any kind of generative output that's needed, whether it's in marketing or in sales, collateral, or even in kind of diverse areas such as accounting and finance. We've seen tons of applications there where generative AI has kind of changed the game, if you will. Interesting. So. I think many people think of this as a relatively new phenomenon, but um, when you say over the past 10 years, um, can you give me a, an example of how that might have manifested beyond the last two years, which is where I think uh, is the horizon that most people think of it? Yeah, it's, what's funny is that kind of the first ideas of generative AI go, go back to the 60s, right? So the first chatbot was this program called Liza, which was designed in in the mid 60s or so. So we've always had this fascination of kind of talking with computers as if we were talking to human beings and everything changed around 2017 when there was this paper that was put out by Google uh, on attention and that that kind of sparked the investments in what we today know as GPT or um, kind of the generative transformer type technologies which has at least for text generation and for language generations changed the game and then in in tandem with that, we now also see generation of music and generation of uh, images and generation of videos, which is, uh, so I think in some sense we've, we're at a point where over the last kind of few years, the, there's been massive strides made in generation of different kinds of creative output. Interesting. So um, you are a professor of marketing. Let's, mm -hmm. let's start there. Can you tell us a little bit about how AI and generative AI is changing the field of marketing and how businesses impact with their, or interact with their customers? Yeah, so there's many dimensions on that. Uh, obviously, if you think about marketing, it's about taking ideas and turning those into, into communications with your customer. That's kind of one of the big kind of elements of marketing. Now you've got this technology that allows you to take an idea and generate outcomes. And the beauty of all of this is you need limited amounts of expertise. So if you have an idea, the, the, the distance between idea and outcome or the idea and kind of implementation has been shrunk and it's been essentially, it's leveled the playing field. So instead of having experts do it, now you can have individuals do it. Uh, who, uh, and that's kind of changed the game. So if you want to generate a subject line header for an email or you want to generate content for an email or write a, uh, a little blurb about your product or create uh, or even create a spokesperson, right? All of those things can be done using generative AI. We're not quite there in perfecting all of those, but, but the path's abundantly clear. Um, another area that I hear a lot about is in finance, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the impact of AI on risk and the risk decisions that we make, uh, risk assessment, just decision making overall. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there's again, um, there's, if you think about, you know, there's a large variety of application areas even within finance. And I'll, I'll broaden this up, let's say finance and accounting. So let's take accounting for a second. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to you. Accounting is inherently uh, a words driven industry, right? Annual reports, uh, disclosures. And so what what generative AI has done, kind of if you flip it around instead of generation, the same tools that are used for generative AI can also be used for summarization or for um, you know, processing of large amounts of text. And that's changed the game for fields like accounting. Uh, and 
connectedly also with finance. So for example, at Booth, there's work going on on creating a generative AI for, for finance or for asset management in particular. Right? So we've taken the tools that we thought were only for text generation, and now we can generate strategies using them. We can generate risk profiles using them. We can generate kind of counterfactual objects that might be interesting to us from a decision-making point of view. And that's not just in finance. I think it's going to have an impact broadly in policy, in economics, uh, in strategy. Anytime you kind of want to ideate alternatives and think about what might happen, now you've got this generative engine. Again, it's not perfect, mm -hmm. but we're on that path. Do you think we will make better risk decisions as a result of having uh, AI tools? That's, that's a big question. Um, the way I like to think about this is, imagine we had access to kind of a not perfect expert. Mm -hmm. Obviously having conversations with, with an expert that can recall like a lot and has experience in a, in a wide variety of decision-making contexts is going to educate our decisions. Ultimately, I think it'll still be for, at least for the reasonably foreseeable future, it'll still be humans making those decisions unless until we get to a point where the AI is, is a lot more sophisticated and people disagree on when that might happen. But for now, it, it's we have this advisor, if you will, who has uh, like a wide variety of expertise and then we can draw on that and that'll obviously improve our decisions. Uh, the extent to which we use that tool and how we use it is still kind of a function of our own abilities, at least for now. I think it's interesting um, whether our mental model is of AI as the expert or of the assistant. And we, we got into that a little bit in one of our other segments uh, when we were talking about healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is it the, the expert or is it more like the intern that you're working with? Yeah, so I think to, for me, um, the difference between kind of the intern versus the expert is are we in AI is doing both, and, or we are playing the role of teacher and student at the same time. So in order for the AI to be built up, obviously we have to teach it. So take healthcare, for example. There's a product called MedPalm that is, uh, that's at Google. At some point, the engineers at Google had to train that AI using all the knowledge we have about medicine. But at the end of the day, when that tool was built, there was a randomized control trial done between physicians and MedPalm and in a completely large-scale randomized trial, there was no difference in terms of prescribing behavior or therapeutic kind of diagnoses between the language model or this medical language model and, and physicians. And at that point, I would say then playing the, the role of an expert. So initially, it's like any intern will become an expert at some point. Just the speed at which some of these models transition from being interns to physicians is short. Interesting. When we talk about generative AI, we often talk about uh, interacting with the chatbot, and mm -hmm. it seems like a very logical place for that is uh, in customer service. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how, how businesses are, are starting to use these tools to change the way they do customer service? Yeah, and I think uh, we've only scratched the surface there. So we are, in some sense, we are encumbered by our own definition of what customer service currently is. We think of it as, you know, we call in and there's somebody at the other end of the line, we have an issue, they deal with that issue. Or we go online and we want to chat with an actual bot and say, here's the problem. Um, so we are at a point in time where these chatbots are exceptionally good. Just today, there was a release of a new um, product, uh, I'm going to name them, but which is essentially a sales assistant, if you will, and they can have a conversation with you in real time, conversationally, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Right? It's, uh, it's better than anything else I've ever seen before. You can interrupt uh, their conversation and in real time it will adjust. Um, and so I think there's, uh, again, a variety of application areas, the simplest of which is here's an issue, deal with it, uh, do, we'll redefine what it means to to engage in customer service. You can imagine a personalized customer service agent that is dedicated just for you mm -hmm. and available to you 24-7 anytime you want. That's not far off thinking. That's We have the technology to do it now. It's just a question of do we have the, is it cheap enough to do it? Um, you know, do we have the GPU resources to do it? But it's there now. So that gets into uh, one of the most common questions I get asked about AI and it comes often from students and sometimes from parents. 
which is really how is AI going to affect employment in the labor market? Um, we've talked about several things where um, it sounds like AI is potentially doing things that people are doing today. Right. How do you think we should be thinking about this? So this, you know, so I'll just start by saying like I'm not a labor economist. I'm, I'm a marketing professor uh, mm -hmm. who's interested in applications of AI. But let me give you an example, right? Where um, I'll sh which kind of hopefully will you know, articulate both the positive and negative sides of this. So a typical thing would be a catalog where we have you know individuals, men and women, wearing shirts and dresses or whatever have you, uh, and those catalogs get sent out to customers. The task of creating that catalog is human intensive, right? So there's a model who has to try on the dresses. There's a photographer. There's a lighting person who's involved. In doing the lighting, all of that production process right, is human manned, if you will, and that ends up with kind of images that then get stuck into, um, into this catalog again by human hands and that ship gets shipped to customers. With generative AI, um, we might not need a model. We can just ask the AI to generate images with this particular dress on a model of our choosing, if you will. Well, if you don't have the model, you don't need the photographer and you don't need the lighting assistant. And it goes from there. So the, you're gonna have disruptions in a number of jobs. So that's just one example. In a law firm, one of the you know, early jobs for an associate is to summarize documents. Well, we have fantastic summarization engines already built in. So what I think is going to happen is it's not gonna eliminate jobs. Some jobs might be eliminated. That might that'd be the extreme form of disruption. But I think jobs will, um, jobs will adapt, right? The type of things that we do will change. Just the same way, you know, I, you know, I teach generative AI, I talk about the calculator being an AI device. It's an, because it is, right? Mm -hmm. And AI changed the way we do math, the way we do calculations, and we don't have to hold in our head certain types of tasks. And I think what's gonna happen with generative AI, or any AI in general, is that we're gonna to adapt to this new technology. So I read this article somewhere, I wish I could remember exactly what it was, in a feel like art. There was a point in time where art was about depicting reality as closely as possible, getting the lighting correct, right? Just still life. And then somebody invented the camera and people said, art's dead. But that's how impressionism came to be and post-impressionism. And I think with this new technology, art won't change, like what well, the art, you know, It'll just adapt. It won't die. It'll just be a new form, a new medium, if you will. And the same thing with jobs. I think we'll find new ways uh, of using this technology to do our jobs better and more efficiently. So continuing in that uh, thought process, what are things that individuals and businesses should do to prepare for the AI capabilities that exist today and, and what you think is is coming in the next few years. Right, so the first thing, I, this is not my quote, but I'm gonna quote Rashad, who's one of our alums, who says, um, AI is underhyped. Mm -hmm. And recognizing that this is not a fad, this is not something that it go away, uh, that is, it's real, and some people would argue that this is akin to the invention of electricity. Right? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, but it's going to change the way we live, the way we work, the way we think and do our jobs. Uh, and so the first thing is to just recognize that we have access or we're living in a time which is truly exciting. There's some fantastic things that are coming our way. Invest in that. And that's true for individuals and true for organizations as well. Whether you're in business or you're a not-for-profit or whether you're an educational institution. Uh, and again, it might feel like, oh, I'm not a tech person, so I don't really... Uh, I can give you examples of friends of mine who are back home, a homemaker in India thinking about using GPT to think about recipes for dinner, right? And so using the technology is kind of the first step. And then thinking about where your holes are, right? Like, do I have the soft and the hard skills? Do I have the technology? Do I have the people and the skills to manage that technology? And looking forward and saying, like, where do I want to be with this? Uh, we were just talking about the fact that my son is going into uh, going to college for film. Right? The conversations I have with him are, well, focus on areas and recognize the fact that those areas will adapt and try and choose 
wisely as to which areas might be impacted more or less by this technology and how it might be. Those are the kind of kind of thinking and conversations that we have to engage in. I think that's a great place for us to end. I think um, so if, if you are a student today, it's not about being afraid of that AI is going to take the jobs away, but it's really thinking about how how things are evolving and thinking about where you need to be. Absolutely, and I think the other thing, the other side of I me, mean, as an as a as a scholar and as an academic and as a teacher, uh, the same thing applies to us too. Which is, we can't be afraid of this technology. It's it's there, you know, and it's going to stay. And we might have to adapt the way we teach. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not just about how students learn. It's also how how we teach. And the sooner we accept that change, I think, you know, we're going to do better. This makes me think, of, I think it's a Wayne Gretzky quote that uh, talks about skating to where the puck is going to be. That's fantastic, yeah. So, I, you know, my wife's from Buffalo. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, that's exactly right. Anticipating where this technology, not that we have the ability to do that. We failed miserably in terms of predicting where this technology and how fast it will move there. If we start thinking of that and planning ahead for that, at least we are moving in the right direction. That's great. Professor Mishran, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. This was uh, really interesting. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us for this segment of our series on generative AI. I'm Kevin Boyd, the CIO at the University of Chicago, and I hope you'll join us for the other segments in our series. Thank you.